Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here on another cold night in Little Rock. We appreciate you uh, uh, coming out. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm Dean of the Clinton School. And welcome again to another program uh, that Nicolai Pippa brings, quality programming uh, that we're proud to share with the community. If I could ask if you would turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off. Uh, to introduce our speaker today is Clinton School student Megan Burrow, who is from Benton and a graduate of the University of Arkansas, UA Little Rock. She studied political science, secondary education, with an emphasis in social studies. She served with the Peace Corps in the country of Georgia. She's worked with the Southern European, Southern Europe Media Organization in Vienna. And at the Clinton School, she's working with a group of her classmates uh, on a literary initiative in Southeast Arkansas. Please welcome Clinton School student, Megan Burrow. In my junior year of college, I studied abroad in Austria and by chance was placed in a master's level course, Civil Society and Political Culture of Southeast Europe. I was one of three students in the class not from the region and I knew little about it. Though the, warm, though the region may be known for violence and strife, through the class I was welcomed with warmth and compassion into a circle of friends, some of which I still talk to every day. These relationships spurred a connection to and interest in a region quite far from my Arkansas roots. After hearing my friends' personal stories about their experiences of loss and uncertainty as children during the wars in Bosnia and Kosovo, I took it upon myself to learn about the conflicts through books, documentaries, and during my trips to Belgrade. My passion for the Balkans is the reason that I can say with great excitement that we have Ambassador James W. Pardue with us at the Clinton School today. He also was raised in the great natural state and found himself in the Balkans. He played an instrumental role in Bosnia when he joined the negotiating team for the Dayton Peace Accords, which brought an end to the Bosnian War, which had lasted for three and a half years. He then went on to assist in the Bosnian Train and Equip Program, the NATO conflict in Kosovo and eventual peace settlement, and the Okrid Framework Agreement in Macedonia. He then served as U.S. Ambassador to Bulgaria during a crucial time for the country, and as a Deputy Assistant Secretary General of NATO for Operation and Crisis Management. Simply listing his job titles, as you can see, takes quite a while. Going into the incredible work he accomplished and its impact would undoubtedly cut into his speaking time. He has now written a book, Peacemakers, American Leadership and the End of Genocide in the Balkans, which delves into the history and reality of the intervention in the Balkans that he will be speaking on today. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador James Pardue to the Clinton School of Public Service. Great, thank you, Megan. So, let's see, I see some friends, friendly faces out there. I'm gonna open up tonight um, with a story about three young men in Arkansas in 1962 in high school. They didn't know each other. The first one graduated from Hall High School in Little Rock in 62. Went to West Point, went to Oxford. In 1995, he was Lieutenant General on the Joint Staff, and that's General Wesley Clark, Arkansas boy. The second young man in 62 was a Nettleton High School graduate in Jonesboro. Went to Arkansas State, had a successful military career. In 1995, he was um, senior exec in the Senior Executive Service of the U.S. Government and was in the Office of Secretary of Defense. That's me. And the third one <clears throat> was, a, uh, was a person who graduated from Hot Springs High in 64. Now you know where I'm going with this. Georgetown, Oxford, Yale Law, and later became the 42nd President of the United States. Um, a savage war in the Balkans, in Bosnia, was, was ongoing in 1995. And that conflict in the Balkans brought the, li the, the lives of these three people from Arkansas together in an attempt to end this savage conflict, bringing peace to the Balkans. 
So my presentation tonight to you is drawn from my book that was just published by the University of Kentucky and shamelessly promoted by this slide on the <laughs> screen here. <clears throat> the point of reference this evening is uh, my experience at the Center of U.S. International Intervention in the Balkans. Because through an, in, uh, an unusual set of circumstances, I was thrust into the middle of that uh, in 1995 and stayed involved until Kosovo declared independence in 2008. It's a great story. It's full of drama and heroes and villains, interesting characters. But I'm not going to talk about the details of the, the diplomacy or the military operations tonight. Rather, I want to concentrate for a few minutes on the consequences of that U.S. intervention and the lessons that I learned from that experience that I think are important to American foreign policy in the world today. But before I get into to that, I do think there's a little context is in order. The, uh, the history of the Balkan region is mingled with the history of the great um, powers of Western civilization. In fact, no other area of Europe has seen more the ebb and flow, the comings and goings of great powers of Western civilization more than the Balkans. This is the land of ancient Greece, of Philip and Alexander the Great, of Rome, Byzantium, the Ottoman Empire, and the Austro-Hungarians. And history is just below the surface in this region. When I arrived in Bulgaria in 2002 to be the U.S. Ambassador, one of the first things I did was attend a ceremony uh, welcoming Pope John Paul, <clears throat> John Paul II to, to Bulgaria. The, uh, John Paul, this, this was a very important briefing uh, meeting because the Bulgarians had been somewhat implicated in the attempt to assassinate the Pope back when it was a communist country, and so they were really looking forward to this visit. So I joined the diplomatic community in, in the Great Square in front of Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, the central cathedral for the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria, and the Pope drove up and uh, was greeted by uh, Patriarch Maxim, the Patriarch of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, along with the President and other dignitaries. So after the visit, I was visiting with foreign minister one day, and I said, foreign minister, oh, it was really great to see the patriarch meet, uh, greet the pope. And he looked up at me, and he rolled his eyes, and he said, party, you have no idea. He said, when the Bulgarian Orthodox patriarch greeted the Roman Catholic pope in front of Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, that's the first time an Orthodox patriarch in Bulgaria has recognized a pope in a thousand years. He said, trust me, it wasn't easy to get him to do that. <laughs> he, he said, he, he's, he's afraid he's going to burn forever for that decision. Um, so we all know that World War II was started in Sarajevo, the killing of the Archduke. Uh, Nazi Germany occupied the area for um, during uh, World War II, and the Soviets dominated much of the region uh, in the Cold War. And each of these great powers left their own imprint on the region and it, they generated a pretty tough uh, population that lived there uh, defend, to defend their own cultures. Uh, the nation of Yugoslavia, the Federation of Southern Slavs, uh, was created from the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 at the end of World War I. And it stayed together for decades but began, but began to break apart along ethnic lines um, in 1991 when communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. The end of Soviet communism was um, amazingly peaceful. I think rarely in the history of the world has such a great and powerful empire completely collapsed as peacefully as the Soviet system did. But the major exception to that peaceful decline of, 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 of communism was Yugoslavia. Uh, the, the wars that accompanied the breakup of, of Yugoslavia beginning in the 1990s were the deadliest conflicts in Europe since World War II, and they produced a level of genocide not seen since the Holocaust. 
An estimated 110,000 people were killed in Bosnia and Kosovo, and over 3 million people became refugees. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I just want to point to three major uh, areas on, uh, during the chronology here. One was the Dayton Agreement. This was the, the agreement that ended the conflict in Bosnia. It was done by uh, largely diplomacy led by Richard Holbrook. The second, uh, in the second, the de democracy or diplomacy failed, and Serbian security forces who were repressing the Albanians in Kosovo were expelled from Kosovo um, by the NATO air campaign, the 78 day air campaign. And then the third one is the one I was most directly involved in, and that was the Okrit Agreement, preventing a civil war in Macedonia. U.S.-led engagement in the Balkans was a major foreign policy success for the United States. It stopped the war in Bosnia that included genocide and crimes against humanity. It ended a deadly humanitarian crisis in Kosovo, and it prevented a civil war in Macedonia. Overall, it restored peace and stability to 40, 50 million people in the region. It enabled seven new nations to be formed, mostly oriented toward democracy and membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the European Union. And the Balkan experiment also reestablished American leadership in Europe on a critical security issue. It was the high watermark of U.S.-Russian relations in the post-Soviet period. But once Putin came to power in 1999, that relationship began to decline, uh, uh, you know, reaching the, the current level of confrontation between the two countries today. The, the uh, response to the breakup of Yugoslavia also transformed a number of international organizations. NATO, in 1995, was focused on its traditional mission of defending Western democracies from a Soviet invasion in Central Europe. It was struggling for an identity after the Berlin Wall came down and communism collapsed. Um, the Balkan experience transformed NATO from this traditional mission to one in which NATO is now, was, became, started to look at missions outside that central region and set the stage for NATO's involvement in Afghanistan um, against pirates in the Mediterranean and, and off of East Africa, and uh, training missions in Iraq and uh, uh, air missions in, um, in Libya. NATO airstrikes in Bosnia and Kosovo were the first actual sustained combat operations for the Great Alliance. And NATO partnered <clears throat> with Russian forces. Russian forces uh, deployed to Bosnia to be part of the implementation force after the Dayton Agreement. And they partnered with other military forces. NATO, uh, Russian military forces on the ground with NATO uh, in a common operation was unthinkable, unthinkable only 10 years earlier, yet, yet it happened. The European Union in 1995 had no foreign policy identity. It was mostly an economic organization. Through, the, through its in involvement in the Balkans, um, the European Union um, developed a high representative, a, essentially a foreign minister for, the, for common foreign and security policy, and uh, an organization, kind of like State Department, uh, of, uh, of diplomats to, to serve uh, EU forces um, replaced NATO in Bosnia, and they were involved in, in developmental missions, economic and political development, in uh, Kosovo. And uh, in Macedonia, the European Union was a co-equal negotiating partner with the United States. I had a, I had a EU counterpart, his name Francois Leotard of France, former minister. And he and I completed the Okrit Agreement. It's the first time the United States and the EU had been co-equal ne negotiating partners. In, an endeavor like that. The United Nations uh, had a very difficult period in, in Bosnia. In fact, it failed in Bosnia to try to keep peace from 1991 until 1995. But it recovered um, um, later, it recovered in Kosovo, and actually governed Kosovo, held, held the sovereignty of Kosovo for a number of years. And UN negotiations 
um, on Kosovo ultimately led to their independence. A UN organization, the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, ICTY, indicted 161 people for genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, and violations of human rights. Eighty of these were convicted and served time in prison for their crimes, some of them life sentences. And those facing justice included uh, a former president, Milosevic, although he died before uh, uh, final justice was served. It included a sitting prime minister and ministers and generals of all the countries involved. Today, the new nations of Yugoslavia have many serious issues and developmental problems. The transition to peace and stability is difficult and is far from over. In fact, none of these um, efforts like this are easy to complete, and it may, in fact, take generations for, for this region to fully develop uh, democ democracy. And, but the new nations born of the former Yugoslavia represent a great experiment in democracy that may fundamentally change the region forever. And that experiment is that the rights of people are defined by, by their citizenship and not by their ethnicity, their race, or their religion. Is this idealistic in places uh, with the history of the Balkans? Sure it is. But it's a best alternative to ethnic wars and divisions that have plagued this region for centuries. My experience in the former Yugoslavia has led me to several con conclusions on the future of U.S. national security and American foreign policy. And at the top of this list of lessons is the critical importance of American leadership and of American values in the international environment. Without the U.S. involvement from 1992 to 1995, the international program to try to stop the killing and the devastation in the region was fragmented, indecisive, and weak as the war grew more and more destructive, and many of you may remember seeing the images on television, the siege of Sarajevo and so forth. The United States was on the sideline. <clears throat> um, this, the uh, military did not want to go to the Balkans, our military. This, the leadership in the U.S. military in, the 19, in 1995, like me, were all Vietnam veterans. They had seen civil wars before, and they weren't eager to jump back in another one. And so the, our military was, was reluctant. And there was a lot of political pressure to leave this problem to the Europeans. And um, conceptually, that may have been right, but the Europeans weren't ready to assume the leadership role that was being thrust upon them. And as a result, the situation continued to deteriorate. All of that changed in uh, the summer of 1995 when the Bosnian Serb army surrounded a, a UN safe area in a small town in eastern Bosnia called Srebrenica. They rounded up the citizens. I watched from Washington where I could see through satellite imagery them separating men from women, loading the women on buses and shipping them out of town. And I thought, uh-oh, this is not good. Well, it wasn't good. They took 8,000 young men and boys into factories and they slaughtered them. At, at that point, um, the U.S. was really, really had to go. We were going to go to Bosnia one way or the other. The Europeans were going to leave, and they were going to expect us to help them out. And so um, the White House, President Clinton, decided that before we would commit troops on the ground, we were going, he was going to launch a, um, a diplomatic effort to try to get some kind of diplomatic solution to this. And he dispatched Richard Holbrook, a bigger-than-life character, and we can talk about him uh, in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, and um, to, to conduct a diplomacy to try to bring a solution to this. Um, I was represented the Secretary of Defense on the Holbrook negotiations. I was less than a year from being a colonel in the United States Army. I had never 
become involved in anything like this. And so, you know, I, went, I did, did what I thought I could do to help them. And it, as time went on, I became more and more confident with Holbrook and the relationship developed into a pretty good one. But what happened when the United States became involved, everything changed. Uh, Holbrook uh, knew how to use American power effectively, and he did it with both hands. Um, it, what, what Holbrook was able to do was to uh, focus the international attention on this problem, focus on his negotiations. He provided energy and mobilized the entire international community into a focused effort. This was, a, this was American uh, leadership at its finest and ultimately restored peace and stability to Bosnia and then went on in Kosovo. American values were at the core of American policy in the Balkans. Americans' democratic values are a source of inspiration and influence around the world. And they should always be a priority, in my view, in our foreign and national security policy. If the United States does not stand by those democratic values, you know, rule of law, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, all of those things that you know from your junior high civics class, if we don't stand behind those values, who will? Um, we should make clear to autocratic leaders like Putin, like Xi Jinping uh, Ping in China and Erdogan in Turkey and others, that we will not ignore violations of key components of democracy and human rights in their nations. The second lesson <clears throat> that I learned in this experience was the importance of Europe and NATO. The United States has other important, e even some cases vital relationships around the world, but none is as important to our security as our bond with the, with the major democracies of Europe. And in that regard, the, small, the, the, the strongest security coalition for the United States is with uh, Canada and our European allies in NATO. Any separation of the United States from our European allies in NATO, in my judgment, will put the security of all of us at risk. The importance of international organizations is another lesson. Success in the Balkans was an example of U.S. leadership of a broad international coalition consisting of our allies, but also consisting of major international organizations, NATO, uh, the UN, the European Union, and OSCE. Now, there's a lot of shallow hostility in Washington today, and it pops up every now and then, about international organizations. In truth, international organizations are only as powerful as the nations allow them to be. They have many weaknesses, and all, anybody who's worked with them recognizes that they have limitations. They can't operate as, as uh, crisply and as effectively as individual nations. They don't have the structure, and it's oftentimes it requires consensus to, to operate. But the advantage of working with international, uh, uh, multinational structures, uh, the advantages are huge. First of all, they reduce the cost. If we share the cost with, with inter, through international organizations with other nations, it reduces the cost to Americans in important security or, or foreign policy issues. Um, and also, by working through these organizations, we have we in, increase our credibility on the, on a um, on important questions. It, um, now. You know, we don't always have the ability to win the day in the United Nations. One nation in the Security Council can veto it. But the fact that we go there, that we're serious, that we make an effort, that we try and we present our arguments uh, um, effectively and, um, you know, with determination, goes a long way towards, toward gaining support for the, whatever it is the United States wants to do internationally. I'm a big believer in working with these and accepting them. It, it takes more time, it's more complicated, but in the long run, it's worth it. Another lesson 
is the relationship between diplomacy and the military. Um, the successful U.S. policy in the breakup of Yugoslavia was led by activist and aggressive diplomacy that was reinforced by very selective and careful use of military force. Holbrook's negotiations in Bosnia were tied after over a period of time more and more closely with the NATO airstrikes that were ongoing. The NATO air campaign in Kosovo won the day, but it did so only after uh, extensive international diplomacy had failed, but that was diplomacy led by the Secretary of State in the United States. We had no other option. Later, U.S. and EU diplomacy uh, prevented a civil war in uh, Macedonia. Now, um, the current administration's disdain for diplomacy in favor of military threats, to me, is uh, shallow and dangerous. In the world today, as complicated and as dangerous it is, we need allies, not self-aggrandizing military parades. One thing is certain, military force alone will not solve international pro all international problems threatening our interest. I think that is particularly true as we deal with the threat of Islamic extremism. The Balkan experience also convinced me that diversity is a fact of life in modern societies. With today's instantaneous flow of information, ease of travel, economic integration around the world, nations can no longer live in the isolation of the past. In this age of diversity, the future unity and strength of democratic nations will be determined not by race and ethnicity, but by shared political and social values and by the equality of justice and opportunity for citizens. Nations that draw on the positive aspects of all groups within generally accepted democratic values in the long run have the greatest chance for security and growth. Those that cannot accommodate diversity are doomed to eternal uh, disunity and conflict. Another lesson for me is the role of the United States in humanitarian uh, crises like those that occurred in the Balkans. I believe that humanitarian intervention is completely consistent with American values and, and that, uh, that such intervention su often supports our national interest. We cannot and should not jump headlong into every international humanitarian problem. But, our, but Americans, America's power, national power, gives us a unique opportunity to lead or to mobilize others to solve uh, humanitarian problems when our national interests are at stake and when other options are no longer available. As an example, I believe that a U.S.-led intervention, humanitarian intervention in Iraq and possibly Syria is appropriate to address the desperate humanitarian crisis in areas liberated from ISIS. It's not enough for us to just drop bombs and to help forces on the ground to uh, run ISIS off. These people need to go back to their homes. They need, they need help. And I think the United States should lead the effort internationally. We don't need to do it all, but our leadership could help relieve the humanitarian disaster that is occurring in Iraq. An American intervention would do two things. First of all, it would be completely counter to the extremist propaganda that the United States only wants to kill Muslims and seize their territory if we help their people return to their homes. And secondly, it would relieve refugee pressure on Europe that is destabilized, is somehow promoting extreme right-wing uh, political activity in Europe and is somewhat destabilizing the Balkans because of these people who are coming in there into a delicate situation. Um, the last of my personal lessons from the Balkans relates to corruption. 
We ran, I ran a military assistance program. It was uh, probably uh, half a billion dollars in Bosnia. It was a pre President Clinton's commitment to help them with their security uh, as a condition for, for the Bosnian Muslims to uh, uh, sign the Dayton Agreement. Uh, but, and we, we raised money um, internationally to support that. But we operated that, uh, with that, those funds in, in a, um, uh, under extensive rules to ensure that donor funding was not misused and that we could avoid corruption. I've now become convinced after that experience that we could, that such practices could be applied to every foreign assistance effort. I believe that corruption, the public, the use of public position for uh, personal gain is the greatest threat to democracy around the world, including our own. We know from painful experience in Vietnam, in Iraq, Afghanistan, that leaders who are corrupt or who accept corruption in their governments have very little public credibility outside their small circle of supporters and, and cronies who benefit from their policies. Corruption makes a mockery of rule of law and of, uh, and of democratic values in general. And the United, United States should never turn a blind eye to corruption by foreign recip recipients of um, assistance programs provided by our country. So the period of American leadership in the Balkans was the high point of American global leadership and influence in the post-Soviet world. And th this uh, policy, um, beginning in, Bo in, in Bosnia and continuing through the Balkans, was among the, f the top foreign policy successes of the Clinton presidency. He, two of these three I issues that are raised, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Macedonia, were accomplished in the Clinton administration. The U.S.-led intervention represents American leadership at its best, and it sets a very high standard <clears throat> for our country as we engage in the world today. I want to emphasize to you this evening that the policies that prevailed in the former Yugoslavia are the, are the polar opposite of the Trump foreign and national security program that we see today. American leadership was based on democratic and humanitarian values and U.S. interests. It fo focused on close association with strong democratic allies and international institutions. Diplomacy led the way, but appropriate military force was used when required. This evening, I want to add my voice to those American foreign policy and national security professionals around the country who are sounding the alarm about the rapidly declining influence of the United States abroad. As I said in a recent opinion article, American leadership is being squandered right now, not because our economic economy is weak or because our military is weak, and uh, not because our values are in question. Our influence is being lost um, because of the uh, unilateralist and nationalist position uh, that's being taken by the current administration. Our influence is declining for two reasons. <clears throat> First, I've already mentioned the unilateralist and nationalist path of the Trump presidency. But it's also being affected, for a second reason, by foreign and domestic attacks on our democracy and on the institutions critical to sustaining it. Internationally, we should not be confused about who are our friends and who are our adversaries. Bluster, belittling, and bullying our traditional allies and minimizing the importance of NATO and other critical international institutions only weakens us. Authoritarian rulers, demagogues and tyrants, like those, some of those I've mentioned, despise democracy. Russia clearly interfered with the U.S. elections for the purpose of undermining our system of government. 
Russia or anyone else who acts to disrupt our democracy or that of our allies must face serious penalties. Failure to, response, to respond uh, only encourages uh, more aggressive action by Russia and others in the future. Of course we should have straightforward and uh, practical relationships with Russia, China, and any number of other autocratic countries, but with conditions and on our terms, not on theirs. On the long run, the level of American influence will be decided uh, by our own confidence in democracy and in the institutions of, our, of, the, of government that ensure it. Unwarranted political attacks on our elections and on institutions critical to democracy and our, and our security undermine the, conf, the basic confidence in these institutions. If our institutions of government become politicized and Americans lose faith in the American justice system, in the FBI, in the intelligence community, in the free and independent press, then our democracy is in serious danger and we become no better, no better than some of the corrupt, corrupt authoritarian governments like those in China, Russia, or Turkey. As a former U.S. Special Envoy for two presidents, I'm particularly concerned about the Trump administration's contempt toward diplomacy and the extreme cuts in the dip diplomatic capability of the State Department and the U.S. Foreign Service. I say this as someone who is not a professional foreign service officer. My background was military. But I am someone who worked very closely with the Foreign Service and the State Department for over a decade. Strong and aggressive diplomacy represented by the State Departments and the professionals in the Foreign Service um, is critical to the strength, security, and influence of the United States abroad. And the damage to those institutions of American diplomacy must be repaired, and the sooner the better. Right now, we appear to be in one of those historic moments that define the United States and who we are as a people. Despite the present decline in American influence around the world, I remain hopeful. This is a great country, but sometimes great countries make great mistakes. The United States is bigger than one man, and the nation also has the capacity for self-correction that I find almost unique in the world. When we have a problem, we fix it. For me, I believe that tough-minded idealism and core democratic values can prevail and get America through this current period of confusion and declining influence. And the United States will again uh, assume the international leadership position that the world so badly needs. But that will only happen if Americans are vigilant, stand strongly behind our democratic system. We must demand that the rule of law and the institutions that guarantee it be protected from corruption and political intimidation, that there, and that there be no infringement of freedom of the press, and that no person, including the President of the United States, is above the law. Thank you very much for your attention this evening. Assessment. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, all right. We've got time for questions. Uh, anyone have one? Would like to throw it? Yeah. Okay. Right here. And then there's one back there. Thank you for coming and sharing your experiences with us. Do you feel, after being so long under the Soviet bloc, in the Eastern bloc, that there may be now a rise of nationalism? among the countries that we're talking about, the little tiff between Macedonia and Greece and so on. Do you see any danger in that since their economies are so weak? Uh, yeah, mo most of these countries, um, they, they, went, they went through a, uh, a various stages of post-Soviet, post-communist um, <coughs> development. Um, in my experience, first of all, the first thing I learned was I didn't realize how corrupting communism was. I mean, every, every one of these countries that existed, uh, the people that lived in those countries, they got by through some form of corruption. Every little thing that they did, well, those, those habits are very hard to break. 
and there's a lot of carryover into that. So people could talk about democracy and rule of law and so forth, but they oftentimes didn't know what it meant. Then there was the, uh, then there was the question of unbelievable expectations for change that, that no one could deliver. In other words, they thought, okay, uh, Russians are gone. We can do what we want. We're going to have elections. We're, 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 we have freedom. So we're going to have elections, and we're all, all going to get rich. You know, we, that's the way democracy works, because they had this vision from Voice of America or whatever. Uh, and it's much, as we all know, it's, there's much more to it than that. It's very hard. So then they went into a period of thinking, well, oh, I'm not sure this is all that good that idea, particularly older people who had some kind of cradle to grave uh, support. And, um, and then many of them, one of the, it started in the Balkans, but I think it's true of, of uh, political leaders, certainly in Eastern Europe, and some would say even here, that there's a political advantage to divisiveness and to praying, using ethnic um, uh, fears to promote political um, advantage. That was certainly true in the Balkans. Milosevic was a, was a dedicated communist. Grew, he became a successful apparatchik in the Soviet, or in the communist system. He was married to a, a woman whose family was with the, uh, the, the communist partisans in World War II. I mean, all his credentials were perfect. Uh, but the, the thing started to change. He went to Kosovo where there were some tensions and gave a speech that said, uh, n no Serb will be uh, attacked by, by any, uh, anyone, Albanians or otherwise, and I will defend you for that. And he got a rousing uh, applause from the Serbian community, and he switched like that from communist to nationalist because he had discovered great political gain in nationalism. And that's, hap that's, happening, um, that's happening in Eastern Europe. It's happening in Western Europe. And some would say it's happening here. I mean, there's a, there, there's a political advantage in playing to fear. Um, so I do not fear that um, a conflict is going to break out between Greece and Macedonia. This, this is a problem that should be easy to solve. It's not. They're working on it. Maybe they, they've got the best opportunity now that they've had in years. Uh, I'm not fearful that war is going to come, break out again. But the tensions, the, uh, tensions continue to be high. But generally speaking, as Dr. King said, the, you know, the arc of history is long, but it's heading in the right direction. I kind of feel that way about the Balkans, that it's, going to, it's a long-term process. Yes, ma'am, we had a question right back here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you mentioned, mentioned Erdogan, and uh, I have a deep interest in Syria. I um, have never understood how the previous administration and this, well, we'll forget this one right now, but uh, how can Erdogan not be challenged for what ultimately erupted through ISIS in Syria when he allowed the free flow uh, across his border uh, for years. Um, Kathy and I lived in Turkey for two years, 1979-81, so I have a deep affection for Turkey. I find it one of the most fascinating places uh, in the world, and Istanbul, one of the great cities of the world. So I have a lot of sympathy for Turkey, and I wish them well, but it's, it's you know, as you know, it's a complicated story. Erdogan is a bad guy. He was elected. He played. He played to nationalism. In uh, a few a few years ago, he he drew the Kurds into the election process, and he was on the in in route to to bringing the Kurds into the political process that was going to be the best thing to happen to Turkey in years. And suddenly, that all he turned all that around. Um, you know, I've been very critical of Trump administration up here tonight. I think the Obama administration also made some big mistakes in Syria. I don't believe in, in uh, um, regime change is the first thing out of the bag. If we had done that with Milosevic, we would have never had a uh, uh, negotiating partner in, in uh, the Balkans. Everybody knew he was a bad guy, should, should be gone, but we didn't run out and announce it. I don't think an American president ought to ever draw a red line and then let it go away. So. 
There were, there were a lot of mistakes uh, that have been made there. I'm not a, an Iraq or Syria um, expert, so I don't, I, <laughs> I'm a little leery of getting too deeply into it, but I, I think uh, we have a very uh, difficult partner, uh, ally in, in Turkey. Um, Erdogan is doing everything to suppress the kind of values I talked about. There is no freedom of press in Turkey. I, I have given a few speeches there in the last few years at universities. Most of them now are closed. Uh, uh, people that were working in universities are now either in jail or uh, on the run. Um, um, the he, the re reaction from the coup attempt a few uh, a year or so ago, uh, he continues to use to repress Turkish society. So I, I think um, my guess is, and I'm not tied into the State Department closely on this, but my guess is they're just trying not to make the situation worse. Uh, he's uh, playing footsie with uh, Russians, buying Russian military equipment. It's all bad. All the signs from Turkey are bad. Um, but it's a very hard problem. I just don't have the confidence in this administration to work through a very complex diplomatic issue effectively. Um, I just don't. Yes, sir, right here. Here comes the microphone's coming at you. Thank you. I was born and uh, I live many years in one of the countries which are on the map there. Mm -hmm. I have no involvement in the former Yugoslavia. But I have a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I live strong. First, a matter of principle. Can you hold the microphone up, yes. please? First, a matter of uh, principle and knowledge. Do you still believe what said Bismarck 150 years ago? No, which I was? Think, I, I think Bismarck's wrong. Next question. <laughs> was wrong, right? Right. OK, it happened in Bosnia. He was right. Next question. Excuse me. What, what Bismarck said was that the Balkans is not worth the the uh, something of a yes, a Pomeranian but the grenadier. reason the reason why he said that was that Balkans is the powder keg of Europe, which is a totally different thing. He said, it, "German don't care. We don't want to have the grenadiers in Balkans." Then you know came the World War One, but that was the reason, and that explains a lot what's happened there. Second. In my opinion, the whole region is a region where there are permanent clashes and historical. Ethnical people are the same, more or less. But it's a clash between Central European and Western civilization and Eastern civilization, East European civilization. And that is a very serious problem. Next. All right, and we're going to have one more because we don't want to pass it around so other people okay. can get some questions. Okay. Next, corruption. Okay. You spend time in Turkey, you know the word bakshish. That is everywhere there. It's for hundreds of years. And if you add the Russian uh, corruption and how it was, a problem. It's a very serious problem. And I will finish here. So I have many things to say. <laughs> Thank you. Your opinions. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, there was a book written before I went to Bosnia the first time. It's called Balkan Ghost. And that Balkan Ghost essentially took the position that these people have been killing each other for a thousand years. They'll never stop and uh, nothing we can do about it. Uh, I found that to be untrue. I found most of them wanted to have some kind of Western civilization and um, to develop according to general democratic norms that had been accepted by Central Europe, and, I, and the Central Europeans would like for that to happen as well. I, I, don't, believe that the, I don't believe that history automatically 
uh, means that you have to stay the same forever. And I think these people can change. I don't believe in clash of civilizations. I certainly don't think we ought to accept that as a doctrine because that leads to ruin. I, I, don't, I don't believe that for a minute. Um, we, like I said, uh, we have launched this, some would say, very naive experiment in, in democracy and rights of citizenship, uh, rights of people according to their citizenship and where they live and not according to their ethnic uh, or religious um, composition. Uh, that is revolutionary in the region. I, there's, I can't guarantee that it's going to work, but it's, uh, w there's a lot of resources that are going into that that um, I think will give it some chance, some hope. And, um, and, and we'll see. It's a long-term process. Is, it, uh, is corruption a major problem there? You bet it is, big time. I, I, that's what I said when, that's what I was referring to when I talked about communism. Those, those habits don't die and um, easily. And, but but uh, little by little, uh, I think it's working. Now, to the degree it's not working, their young people leave. What does that tell you? Young people don't want to live in that stuff, and they, they, they move out. There's, there's a massive outflow of young people out of the Balkans into Europe and the United States. And these are really smart people, by the way. Uh, these are young kids or dynamos. They get out of that environment and they just blossom. Um, um, and, you know, I'd welcome as many of them coming here as I could, but uh, not these days. Anyway, that, they, they, uh, that tells you that the young people in the, in the, in the region want to want to live in in places where there is rule of law where corruption is minimum and that where they can have opportunities and I, I, I feel hopeful about that what I'd like to do is see a lot of them who are very successful go back and some of that happens and to take those values back home with them mr. Besser you uh, you you've written in your book you talked about the, the three Arkansans you and, a, and, Clark. and President Clinton and General Clark You've also written in your book about another one who uh, has spoken here at the school and uh, has been uh, very active uh, in, in our community for years. And you write about a trip you took mm -hmm. with Mac McClarty, uh, a really unique trip. And when I read that, it was, it was fascinating. Could you share that story? Yes. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we had, um, President Clinton had made a commitment um, with the Bosniaks to help them with their security. And you, it was to be a U.S.-led um, assistance program. Um, and we had $100 million worth of excess U.S. equipment available from the U.S. Congress. But we didn't have any money. And um, we needed financial resources to hire um, trainers because the U.S. military didn't want to do that. So we had to hire uh, private contractors to do it. Um, I went around, flew around the world uh, with my tin cup trying to get uh, particularly Muslim countries to donate uh, to the cause and they all, they have very sophisticated ways of telling you no or maybe and it tur maybe turns to no. So I went back and I told Sandy Berger, Sandy, I, this ain't working. I need, I need help and I had gotten indications from the Saudi ambassador in uh, Washington, Prince Bandar who had been the Saudi ambassador for a number of years, and he kept saying to me, you know, we had a really, really close relationship with the Bush administration back during the Gulf War. I mean, the message to me was, you know, he'd like to have the president more involved in this. So, uh, Tony Lake, the national security advisor, Sandy Berger, and the president decided that the way to do this was to send Mac McClarty, uh, his personal representative, out to the Gulf. I had never met Mac before, Mac before. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, Mac wasn't so convinced. He said, uh, I'm not going out there unless, I, unless there's a good chance that this is going to work. And so um, he was ready to go. The plane was on the uh, tarmac at Andrews. We had uh, a U.S. plane to take us over there. I was in the West Wing. Um, and Max says, I, I need some assurance here. Uh, so we were trying, the president was trying to track down Bandar to find out whether or not this was going to work. Bandar disappeared. Couldn't find him anywhere. So the, the, uh, the security guys said, you know, he has American security. Let's try that. So 
they went through the American security system and they tracked down his security guards and they found him at some ski resort or someplace. And the president, you know, he can't turn down a phone call from the president, so uh, the president gets on the phone with him and Bandar says, yes, yes, I'm sure this is going to work. So Mac then, come, we get on the airplane, we fly off to Jeddah, we meet in these incredible palaces like something out of an Orientalist painting with the guys in robes and long swords and all that. Meet with the crown prince um, uh, the, because the, the, the king was ill, elderly and ill. And uh, we met for a long time, and uh, it's in, as I say in the book, uh, finally Matt gets around after drinking a lot of tea and a lot of chit chat. Uh, um, you know, Prince, we need uh, we need your help. And the prince says, uh, "How much help?" <laughs> and Max says, uh, "Well, we're thinking in the range of about fifty million dollars." And the, Prince flinched and he said, billion dollars? He said, no, million dollars. Oh, 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 okay. Suddenly, I mean, that made it a whole lot easier. <laughs> uh, I, that was a shocker for me. I watched that and I think, oh. Um, I have one more Arkansas story to tell after this because it's kind of interesting. Um, anyway, we went on from there to the UAE. Um, they committed 25 million, uh, uh, the Kuwait 25 million, and we came back. So, when I wrote the book, I, I, you know, and on this trip, when you travel for several days, and it's just the three or four of you sitting in the back of the airplane, you know, you get to know someone pretty well. And I really like him. He's very, he's a very great guy. And so I wrote the book, and I, I sent the sent the draft in to him and I said, hey, Mac, you know, this is your story, so look this over. And so he went back and forth, you know, and then I sent him um, the manuscript and then finally the book came out. I sent him a copy of the book and he, he got back to me. Very gracious. He asked me to send a copy to President Clinton, which I did. And, um, and then I got an email a few days ago that I feel real good about. They said they want to know your address so President Clinton can write you a note. So I'm, I'm running to the mailbox when I get home. <laughs> But let me tell you one more Arkansas story. Listen, uh, I think it would be great if you and Mac would make that trip again and get that money for the Clinton School. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Well, you propose that to President Clinton well, and see I, what I, he I, does. I, I, you've, got my, you've got me thinking. <laughs> All right, what's your other story? Okay. Um, at the, in Bosnia, we, were very, we worked very closely with the Russians. Now, you know, I've, I've criticized Russia tonight. Russia's a great country. It's a huge country. It's a powerful country, badly led. But, I mean, we can and have worked effectively with them. Um, uh, in Bosnia, they were very close to us, and I got to know their political director, who's like the number three person in the, in the foreign ministry. His name was Igor Ivanov. And uh, I used to tease him. He was flying around on NATO airplanes. Igor, we're going to make you an honorary member of NATO and you know, all that stuff. And so... He leaves, Bosnia's over, relationships are bad and all that stuff, and he goes back to Moscow in the Putin administration, and I go off and do um, the Macedonian thing, Elkert Agreement. After the Elkert Agreement, we, Leotard and I, flew to Moscow to brief the Russians on what we had done because we never wanted any confusion in Moscow about what was going on here. So we were in the foreign minister, one of these big, uh, what they call it, uh, so old Soviet building skyscrapers. That's the foreign ministry in Moscow. And uh, at the toward the end of the meeting, uh, Ivanov came in, and he had he had become the foreign minister of the Russian Republic. And he said, "Hey, Jim, you know, uh, when this is over, come up and see me." So after the meeting, you know, aides grabbed me and hauled me up to the office and come on in. So he very graciously he took me back into the private office of the foreign minister of the Russian Republic. And I looked around, and I'm saying, this is the office of Andrei Gromyko and all those guys from the Cold War. This is a long way from Jonesboro. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, first of all, I, Little Rock is not a long way from Jonesboro. <laughs> and we're really glad that you could come back to Arkansas. I know you spoke at Arkansas State and, and, uh, earlier. And we're honored to have you at the Clinton School. and. I hope everyone will come visit with the ambassador uh, and purchase and, and let him sign the book. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much thank for being you with so us. Great. Thank you.